was 1969. <laughs> the year of Woodstock, the moonwalk, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I was 18, a freshman at Seattle University, and it was Friday night at Bellarmine Hall. Not exactly a date night for me and my gaggle of gal pals, but possibly an evening of wanderlust. On several occasions during that first year of college, I made the trip to SeaTac Airport with the American tourist or luggage my parents gave me for high school graduation. <laughs> but there was a quirky thing about my red lipstick-colored suitcase. She was empty, and I was going nowhere. It was my version of virtual travel, and the rules were quite simple. <laughs> Take a look at the departures and arrival board, select a destination, and head for the appropriate gate. <laughs> After all, it was decades before the post-9-11 security measures were put into place, and roaming around an airport was still OK. Sometimes, if feeling extra flush, we'd stop in at the airport's Carvery restaurant, a dark and smoky place where people gathered for a fancy surf and turf dinner or a dry martini or two. But most often, we'd head straight to our gates, whether it was LA, New York, or Copenhagen. There, we'd strike up a conversation with fellow travelers, fabricating stories about where we were flying off to. <laughs> when tired of telling tales, we'd pick up our empty bags and head back to the dorm. <laughs> there was something about the pulse of the airport that seeped into my system during those SeaTac visitations. And several months later, I ditched my fake travel for the real thing and flew off to Honolulu on spring break. The air from Seattle at the time was $180 round trip on Pan Am. It was my first time on an airplane, and I was hooked. <laughs> Most of my friends at the time were 19 or 20, and all of us in the midst of deciding who and what we could be. Back then, the choices were much more limited than they are for young women today. For me, a Catholic girl from a small town in Snohomish County, my four options included teacher, nun, nurse, stewardess. <laughs> Being a travel writer was not in the mix. My real travels continued amidst school and work, including a cross-Canada train trip from Vancouver to Montreal, living in Switzerland, and convincing my husband-to-be to take the money that he'd saved to buy a house and spend it on our Scandinavian honeymoon. <laughs> it must have worked as this summer, Farmer Bob and I are returning to Norway to celebrate our 40th anniversary. <laughs> so how did my love of travel, travel morph into what I do today as a freelance writer and photographer, a job I didn't even know existed in 1969? I have to thank my friend and mentor, Jim Larson, who as editor of the South Would Be Record, asked me to write a weekly column, which I cranked out for 15 years. From there, I leaped into travel writing, using words and images to tell the stories of the places I'd been. That's what travel writers do. We share our stories with you. I've been fortunate to journey to the seven continents during my travels, from Africa to Antarctica. I've been up close with the polar bears of Churchill, Manitoba, slept on a night train in Vietnam from Hanoi to Sapa, tasted wine and looked for koala bears in Australia, dreamt about being a tango dancer in Buenos Aires, <laughs> and became very, very lost in beautiful Barcelona. But it's the people I meet along the way that make me laugh, smile, and understand. That's truly why I travel. Whether it's a conversation with the passenger in the seat next to me on a flight to Chicago, or chatting with a waiter in Quebec, the human factor is what keeps me going. Several years ago, I met Andy Vu in Sapa, Vietnam, a mountain town near the Chinese border, home to the Hmong people. I hired him to be my tour guide for the morning, and he took me to a small village where I met several families. After the tour, I invited Andy to lunch, and we went to one of his favorite restaurants. Today, Andy and I keep in touch via Facebook and last year, I sent him warm wishes on his wedding day. My strongest memory of my trip to Vietnam is not the fine pho I had in Hanoi or sleeping on a junk boat in Halong Bay. 
It's Andy, my Vietnamese tour guide, who shared a small slice of his life with me for one day. I'd like to wrap things up with a quote from Maya Angelou that's on the homepage of my website. Perhaps travel cannot prevent bigotry, but by demonstrating that all peoples cry, laugh, eat, worry, and die, it can introduce the idea that if we try and understand each other, we may even become friends. Thank you.